Shalom, shalom. Devon Mays here uh, <clears throat> with Clouds of Torah presents Why I Left Christianity Part 2. Why did the educated Jews reject Jesus? So a lot of people are not familiar with um, the disciples being ignorant in the text. And some even thought Jesus himself was ignorant or not learned in the Torah. So let's jump right into this. So again, I want to talk about why did the educated Jews reject Jesus? And this should open up some eyes. So <clears throat> who was Jesus and what did he do? Well, according to the text and depending on which book you read, he didn't do what the Messiah was supposed to do. He did other things because people focus on the miracles and the preaching and arguing with the Jews, but exactly like doing messianic things. He didn't bring that to the table. So the first thing is people talk about he was the Messiah. Well, he was never king and the Messiah will be a king. We see in John 6, 15, when it says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again unto a mountain alone. So if he was really the Messiah, why would he run away from being a king? Well, some would say, well, it wasn't his time yet. Then that just proves that he wasn't the Messiah if it wasn't his time. So that argument actually proves the point of why the Jews would have rejected somebody who's not doing the job. So in Deuteronomy 17, 14 and 15, it says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God has given you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So I bring this up to the Trinitarians to say, well, Jesus is God and God it will be the Messiah. Well, God is not a brother of the Israelites. He is their father. Doesn't say you should set a father over you. It just says you should set somebody who is not your brother, like you've got to be related to the Israelites, but they're, they're going to be brothers because the tribes are all related. God is not a brother of the Israelites. He is their father. Deuteronomy 32, 6. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? He is, is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? And we see in the book of Luke chapter one, verse 32, it says, according to the Christian theology, that God will give Jesus the throne of David, his father. So if David is the father of Jesus, are you saying David is the father of God? If Jesus is God? Think about that. So Jesus was never a king. That's the whole point of this um, slide right here. And when they came to make him king, he didn't want it. He, he dipped. He departed again onto a mountain alone, right? So, you know, you got to consider that. <clears throat> Where will the king, kingdom of David be? So in Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28, again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, take a piece of wood and carve on it these words. Excuse me. This represents Judah and its allied tribes. Then take another piece and carve these words on it. This represents Ephraim and the northern tribes of Israel. Now hold them together in your hand as if they were one piece of wood. When your people ask you what your actions mean, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take Ephraim and the northern tribes and join them to Judah. We know the, 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 the 10 tribes were not in the land collectively in the New Testament time. So this couldn't have happened then. I will make them one piece of wood in my hand. Then hold out the pieces of wood and you have inscribed so the people can see them. Give them this message, this message from the sovereign Lord. I will gather the people of Israel from among the nations. I will bring them home to their own land from the places where they have been scattered. I will unify them into one nation on the mountains of Israel. One king will rule them all. No longer will they be divided into two nations or into two kingdoms. They will never again pollute themselves with their idols and the vile images and rebellion, for I will save you from their save them from their sinful apostasy. I will cleanse them. Then they will truly be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be their king, and they will have one only have one shepherd. 
they will obey my regulations and be careful to keep my decrees. So anybody talking about there's no law and that the law is abolished must never read the future prophecy of the king of Israel. They will live in the land I gave my servant Jacob, the land where their ancestors lived. So when Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, if we're talking about the kingdom of Israel on earth, it says where Jacob and his ancestor lived, ancestors lived. So that's clearly on earth. They and their children and their ch grandchildren after them will live there forever, generation after generation. And my servant David will be the pr their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant, and I will give them their land and increase their numbers, and I will put my temple among them forever. So we have a temple, we have Israel back in their land, and they have a king. I will make my home among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And when the, my temple is among them forever, the nations will know that I am the Lord who makes Israel holy. This is not going to be a belief. Everybody's going to know Israel's in the land, and God is there because this temple is going to be there, and there's going to be a king. This didn't happen in the New Testament, so why would they accept somebody that doesn't even teach that he's going to do these things? Because what did he say when confronted by Pilate? He asked him a simple question. What was Jesus' response? John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not, <clears throat> is not of this world. Because what if he would have said, my kingdom is of this world where we're standing in Israel? Then that would have been a problem with the Roman authorities, and he would have been killed because there's only one king, which was Caesar. So by Jesus claiming that his kingdom is not of, is not of this world, that doesn't work with Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. So out of his own mouth, in front of everybody who was present, when Pilate questioned him, he says he's not the king of Israel. His kingdom is not part of this world. And for those who try to say, oh, he was silent before, you know, his accusers, he's answering Pilate right here. So he's not so silent. And he gives a statement that completely contradicts what the Messiah is supposed to do. Be the king, king of Israel in Israel, because at the time, uh, Herod and Caesar and other, other people are ruling this place. Pilate's the governor. These are all Romans ruling where he's supposed to rule. So to say all the, the rabbis rejected him or the Pharisees rejected him just because they were they were blind and they didn't understand. Well, it wouldn't make sense to accept him when he's not even teaching what the Torah said he's supposed to do. So what did Jesus come to accomplish? Matthew 10, 34. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, everybody knows that the Messiah is supposed to be a peace bringer. Isaiah 2 and 4, the Lord will mediate between nations and will set internal, settle inter international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like bringing peace. In Matthew 10, 34, as Isaiah talks about, if you're not going to learn war anymore and they will not fight again, uh, fight against each other, why is Jesus coming to bring a sword? That's the opposite of the prophecies. So, again, if you heard if you heard Jesus preaching, he doesn't sound like he's the Messiah of the Tanakh. He sounds like he's like his own self-proclaimed version of a Messiah which has nothing to do with the Tanakh. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. So here's a clear prophecy of what the Messiah is supposed to do and the time frame. And a lot of people don't realize that the Tanakh doesn't specifically talk a lot about what the Messiah will be like himself, but it does, does tell you what the world will look like when he's there. So what kind of world will, will we be living in when there's a Messiah on the ground? Isaiah 11, 6 through 12, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leper shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear, bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Some say that this is figurative and not literal, 
And that when it says the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, it means the nations won't attack Israel. You know, um, the the leper shall lie down with the young goat. It's just like a, a, a symbolic time of peace between Israel and the rest of the nations. Now, if it's taken literal, we know that didn't happen. If it's taken symbolically, we know that didn't happen in the time of Jesus. So every any way you want to look at this, none of these things happen in the time of Jesus. Verse 8, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy, <clears throat> destroy in all my holy mountain. Well, there was crucifixions going on in the time of Jesus. The Romans was killing people. They were taxing the people. Like, there was a lot of problems during this time. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Well, there was Roman idols all over the place. Um, doesn't sound like the earth was full of the knowledge of the Lord at this time. Uh, Zeus and Jupiter was being worshipped. Athena, uh, Diana, so many different uh, gods, especially the Roman gods, right? Zeus had his own temple in the book of Acts. So this is definitely not the time frame of the New Testament. As the waters cover the sea, and in that day there should be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Well, when Jesus was first preaching, he says, don't go to the Gentiles in Matthew chapter 10. So how would the Gentiles seek him? Now, later on, he says, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. But his original message, he said, don't go to his, go, don't go to the Gentiles. I only came to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 11, <clears throat> it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. None of these things happened. So there's a lot of key things going on in the actual prophecies that never took place so if you were on the ground at the time of Jesus, you would be looking for these things. Now, remember in Luke 17, when the rabbi says, where is this kingdom? Jesus says, you cannot observe the kingdom. It's not observable. It's in within you. So it was a belief. It was not something that was actually going to happen that you could see. Everything that I just read, you can see everybody coming back to Israel when it says to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, e Egypt, from Pathos and Cush. Today with the technology, you can witness all these things happen. Massive migrations of people flowing into Israel from the four corners of the earth. You're going to see that. That won't be a belief. <clears throat> so the opposite happened. Instead of all that peace in gathering of Israel, we see war, persecution, and exile instead of peace. Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that it's, its desolation is near. So Jesus was not preaching a peaceful time to come upon Israel. And as far as the gathering of Israel, James 1 and 1, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So the brother of Jesus is telling you, the tribes are scattered. The opposite happened when Jesus came. Instead of them being gathered, they're kicked all over the place. Matthew 24 and 9. Instead of being a savior, he tells you you're going to die because of him. Matthew 24 and 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Well, in Isaiah, it says the Gentiles shall seek him, or the nations shall seek him. But here it says that the nations are going to hate people for his because of his name. Again, the opposite. So if you heard all this preaching and you knew your Tanakh, you knew Isaiah chapter 11, you know Isaiah chapter 2, and you heard Jesus, Jesus the message of Jesus, you're like, well, he's not the guy. He's got a different message. A completely different message. Division instead of unity. <clears throat> Luke 12, 51 through 53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all. 
Not at all, but rather division. From now on, on five and from now on, five and one house will be divided. Three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Malachi 4, 4 through 6. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So if Elijah is supposed to come and gather people and bring them together to get along, the fathers and the children, and Jesus is coming to divide people, we got a conflict of interest. Now, Jesus said Elijah already came. So if Jesus came, um, let me say that again. If Elijah has already come, according to, in the book of Matthew, um, Jesus is telling his disciples that uh, Elijah has already come. And he, basically he explains it, that that was John the Baptist, right? He's saying John the Baptist was Elijah who has already come. Cause they asked him, isn't Elijah supposed to come first? He says, Elijah already came. The problem is if Elijah came and fulfilled this prophecy, if he turned the hearts of the children to the fathers, then Jesus said he came to break that up. He came to bring division. So wouldn't that be counterproductive? It doesn't make sense. So again, educated people who know their Torah, who know these things and are asking questions are like some, this is not who we thought he was. This is not what the, the, the Messiah is supposed to do. It's opposite. Everything is the opposite. <clears throat> Jesus says John is the greatest prophet, but John denies it. Matthew 17, 10 through 13. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? We just read Matthew. I mean, we just read in Malachi that God says he's going to send Elijah. What's he going to do? So the disciples is asking this. It says, why do the scribes say it? Well, the scribes say it because the Tanakh says it. Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. So let's think about that. If John is Elijah, when did he restore all things? But I say to you that Elijah has come already. I say to you that Elijah has come already, but they did not know him, but did, did to him whatever they wished. Now, what happened to John? He was beheaded. So if John was Elijah, they killed him. The interesting thing, when Elijah was alive, before he was taken up in heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2, he was able to call down fire on his enemies and they couldn't touch him. So we... We don't have the same type of person going on here. Likewise, the son of man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So Jesus is saying Elijah is John the Baptist. And who's supposed to restore all things. This did not happen. It didn't happen. Luke 7, 28, for I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, this is interesting because this is those born of women. There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Well, Jesus was born of a woman. Is John greater than Jesus? According to Jesus, yeah, he's not a greater prophet. Now here comes a bigger problem. John 1, 19 through 21. Now, this is the testimony of John. What does John have to say about all this? When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So he's not Elijah and he's not a prophet and he's not the Messiah. But Jesus just said he was the greatest prophet, born of a woman. John denied it all. He denied being Elijah after it says he spoke to them of John the Baptist. The, the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. He said, Elijah has already come. 
John says, nope, that's not me. So again, if you're there and you're hearing all this testimony, why would you be so quick to think Jesus was the Messiah in the Tanakh? What's going on? The Jews get accused of just being evil and not knowing the scriptures. Well, I see a different story here. I have hated the assembly of evildoers. So, if you were there hearing Jesus preach and watching what he was doing, what would you think about him? Psalm 26 and 5 says, I have hated the assembly of evildoers and I will and will not sit with the wicked. So here the psalmist is saying, I don't kick it with the wicked people. Matthew 9 and 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So here we have a psalmist saying that they will not sit with the wicked. And we see here Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees, right? The educated people. If they know their psalm, they're like, mm, he supposed to be the Messiah. Psalm 1, 1 through 2, blesses the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Proverbs 20 and 8, a king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. Kings don't tolerate evil. A righteous king doesn't tolerate evil. I said he scatters all evil with his eyes. That's not what's going on here. And Jesus was never king. Does Jesus practice what he preaches? Mark 10, 7 through 9. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus, Genesis 2 and 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. We know the commandment, be fruitful and multiply. Was Jesus married, and did he have children? Some say he did, depending on which book you read. There's apocryphal books and all kind of stuff, you know, books that didn't make it into the New Testament uh, canon that says he was married to Mary. But according to the canon, um, he doesn't have a wife or children. So he's telling you that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, but he didn't do this. And we know that the Messiah is going to have children and leave an inheritance to his children. Read Ezekiel chapter 47, I believe, 46, 47, when it says the prince will leave an inheritance to his sons. So who was that prince? Look it up. Look it up. Jesus can fast, but his disciples cannot fast. Matthew 9, 14 through 15. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? So right away, some interesting things. John still has his own disciples. And John's disciples and the Pharisees, see eye to eye on fasting jesus answered how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them from them then they will fast so he basically saying while i'm here they can't fast but jesus can fast but his disciples cannot fast although this is a command from the torah and the oral tradition now remember in the beginning of the gospels jesus is taken into the desert and tempted by the devil and he fasts. But his disciples not allowed to fast while he's there. And if they can't fast, there's a commandment that they have to fast. Now, some of these commandments are oral tradition, because when you read, it talks about some different uh, fasting that these Pharisees do. It's not specific here of what fast they're talking about, but it says how can they mourn while he is with them? So for three years, they didn't do these fasts. Now, here's the problem. John supposedly has Holy Spirit, right? 
Jesus says he's the greatest prophet. So if the greatest prophet, according to Jesus and his disciples, is fasting with the Pharisees, often the John's disciples came and asked him. Now, these ain't even the Pharisees asking. John's disciples came and asked him, who Jesus says is the greatest prophet, the one who baptized Jesus, right? How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? So John's people is questioning, how come you don't get down like us and the Pharisees? So what's going on? Everybody's peeping game of how he, him and his boys is rolling, right? So fasting is decreed by Moses, prophets, and Queen Esther. Leviticus 23 and 29. Anyone who refuses to fast on this day must be separated from their people. You know, this is talking about Yom Kippur. That's one fast. Zechariah 8, 19. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will be joyful, become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. So we see these different fasts that the prophets recognize. It. Now, you won't read about these other fasts in the Tanakh. This is all oral tradition, right? Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Esther 931. To establish these days of Purim at their designated times as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. This is Purim. Read the book of Esther. It's another holiday. And actually, they says they, they gave gifts and stuff during Purim. I wonder... That's kind of where Christmas got they theme from. But I don't know. Read Esther for yourself. If you say Purim is not an obligation, what about Hanukkah? Purim is not mentioned in the New Testament, as far as I know. It could be, but I don't I don't remember reading it. But I did read about Hanukkah. John 10, 22, 22 through 23. Then came the festival festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon, Solomon's colonnade. Now, it's interesting. The 25th of Keslev is Hanukkah. The 25th of December is Christmas. Coincidence? It was winter. And I believe like every 19 years or something like that, Christmas and Hanukkah fall on the same day. Coincidence? Now, the sneaky thing is most translations call this the Festival of Dedication. But the footnote says that is Hanukkah. So Hanukkah is an oral tradition. We know the Maccabees and all that stuff. But again, is it was decreed to be kept. And Jesus is keeping that holiday. So why wouldn't he be keeping Purim? So you're telling me that his disciples can't fast with whatever days John and the Pharisees was fasting on his disciples didn't do it. So I'm pretty sure that the Pharisees fasted on Yom Kippur and it sounds like John's disciples got down with the Pharisees. So that's a, that's a fast day that they didn't keep the fast of the fifth. They didn't keep. Um, Purim, another fasting that they didn't keep. So, I mean, you, you see all these different days going on here. So Jesus can fast, but his disciples can't. So he's basically making them sin for three years because it says as long as he's here, they can't do these things. And we know that they were still keeping the holidays after Jesus died. Yom Kippur was still in effect this whole time, the whole time of his ministry, because we notice that, you know, New Testament, the Pharisees and people that's calling them out on stuff. They would have been like, how come you're not keeping, a, you know, Yom Kippur? Oh, you keeping it, but your disciples can't. Oh, I see what's going on. Or was he not keeping the fast days either? Because it says, it just says, but your disciples do not fast. It doesn't say you and your disciples. It just says, but your disciples do not fast. Maybe there's a translation that says you and your disciples, but right here in Matthew says, but your disciples do not fast. So it's not really accusing him, it's accusing his students. So he's making his students to sin by not keeping all these holidays that require fasting. 
So Yom Kippur was celebrated after Jesus was executed, and Paul made sure to keep the feast days that included sacrifice. Yeah, Paul kept the, the feast days. See how many times he talks about Pentecost in the book of Acts. Now, Acts 27 and 9, it says, Much time had been lost and selling had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. Footnotes, that is Yom Kippur. So the Day of Atonement is in effect after Jesus is gone. So if the ministry of Jesus lasted three years, his disciples broke the law for three years. Again, educated Jews was peeping this all they they peeping they peeping the scene like mm, he's just really not doing what a Messiah would do. And you got his his students out here bogus, right? So if Yom Kippur was still celebrated and the temple sacrifices were promoted by James, why would Jesus have to die for anybody? Because if Yom Kippur was still a celebrated holiday. You get your sins forgiven anyway. So why would you have to come and die for people? Leviticus 23, 28. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement when atonement is made for you before the Lord. So if I'm keeping the day of atonement, why would Jesus have to die for anybody? On top of that, we know blood is not the only way to deal with sins. I got a whole video on it. And if you want to bring up Leviticus 17, I have a whole video on the miseducation of uh or the the mis um um the misunderstanding of Leviticus 17. It's not even really talking about atonement. It's really dealing with eating blood and what people did with blood and why you're supposed to pour it out on the ground and all these other things. The 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 topic of the verse, the the, the context of the verse is not really talking about atonement. It's kind of a by the way thing, but what's the point of them talking about leviticus 17 11 the christians want to say all oh, right here it says life is in the blood and we know that life is in the blood you somebody bleeds out they're probably going to die right <laughs> you only got so much blood that you cannot live without but that wasn't the point of leviticus 17 read the whole chapter again uh shout out to somebody I, off the top of my head i forget but somebody made a meme talking about um there's a movie called Straight Out of Compton, and they made a meme about Jesus and his boys called Straight Out of Context. Kind of funny. So that's pretty much what the Christians do. They come straight out of context and just will say anything that sounds all right to other Christians. So Leviticus 5, 11 through 13. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sins shall bring for his offering one tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Then he shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar according to the offerings. Made by fire to the Lord, it is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin that he has committed in any of these matters, and it shall be forgiven him. The rest shall be the priest as a grain offering. No blood. So that basically means if you was poor, you probably wasn't normally given any animal sacrifices because it says if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, let's say you couldn't find no pigeons or turtle doves for whatever reason. Even if you probably had some money and you were supposed to bring that, bring that flower, and you was good. But if there was a shortage, supply and demand, right? You was good with the flour and the oil. No, it says you should put no oil on it, but he should put frankincense on it, right? But it's still a sin offering. Isaiah 27, 9. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is the fruit of taking away his sin. Oh, Jacob is called a his sin, right? You know, people talk about Isaiah 53. When it says he and him, it's always talking about a one individual. We know Jacob is dead. So this is clearly talking about Israel. This is the iniquity of Jacob. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit taken away his sin. Who's his? The nation? We're in Isaiah. So don't tell me Isaiah don't talk about Israel as a he and a his and a him. 
when he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. When he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones, who's he? Is that Israel too? Is he called a he and Isaiah? Again, where's the blood? It says we basically when you break up all your altars and turn them into dust, then your sins will be forgiven. This is all the fruit of taking away his sin. Get rid of your idolatry. Where's the blood at? There's no need for nobody to come and die for your sins. This is three different ways right here. Yom Kippur, which is yearly built into the calendar. If you can't afford two turtle doves and two young pigeons and stop worshiping idols, break them up. On top of repentance. So, and read 1 Kings chapter 8. When you're not even in the land, you tor turn towards the land and pray to it. Just like Daniel did in, in Daniel chapter 6. So many different ways to get forgiveness of sins. So again, if you was on the ground and you knew all this, if you were educated, then people say, why you reject Jesus? It's like, why accept him? He's not doing nothing to show me anything. Like if somebody's trying to sell you something and you're just not impressed, like why am I going to spend money on that? Especially if you have something, right? You got a Beamer in the garage and they're trying to sell you a Corolla. Like, no, I'm good. Right? <laughs> you, you're giving an inferior product. He's teaching against the Torah. He's saying he's bringing war and I'm about peace. And like, I want what the Messiah is supposed to do, not what you're out here teaching. His disciples don't fast. Like, what? What? But you trying to say, why am I rejecting him? He ain't showing me nothing to accept him. He ain't the king. He telling Pilate his kingdom is not of this world. Pilate got one of his jobs, right? A, a position of authority. Because the word governor, I think uh, Solomon was called governor. We know he was the king, but it's just a position of power. Herod was the king. Jesus was supposed to have that role. So... To say, oh, the Jews rejected him because they were ignorant. They didn't know. They didn't have the spirit. Whatever you want to say, no. This is just simple uh, math. <laughs> the Torah says this. He's doing that. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Deuteronomy 24, 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be, be put to death for his own sin. So if you say, well, you know, that was for the Old Testament. That's gone away, right? The book of Hebrews try to say that the, the Torah is old and fading away. What about in the future? Jeremiah 31, 29, 30. In those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Side note. Every time the Christians read Jeremiah 31 and they want to talk about the new covenant, they always start at verse 31. They go to Jeremiah 31, verse 31. They never read verses 29 and 30. You know the verses that precede verse 31? Because if you got to go in those days, you're going to have to die for your own iniquity. Then that means during the new covenant, guess what? Everyone will die for their own iniquity. This can't apply to Jesus and his covenant that he talks about in the New Testament because he's telling you he's going to die for them. His blood is poured out for many or his blood, blood, blood is shed for the many. Right. Well, that's not what this says. In those days. In those days, one of those days, everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Ezekiel 18, 20 through 23, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father 
bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? It don't get no clearer than that. Three different prophets, you die for your own sin. I mean, how many times does the Tanakh have to say that over and over, even talking about the future in Jeremiah 31? So don't tell me about the old covenant when it says in those days in the new covenant era. Read it for yourself. Don't start at verse 31. Actually, read Jeremiah 31. Verse 1 through 31 for, for that context. Stop coming straight out of context. Human sacrifice is not acceptable. Isaiah 66 and 3. Now, some translations play with this and try to avoid what's really going on here. But the New Living Translation can be a weird translation. But right here, they got it. They got it on this one. I got to give it to them on this verse. I'm not going to, you know back them on everything but for this verse i can't argue with it isaiah 66 3 new living translation but those who choose their own ways delighting in their detestable sins will not have their offerings accepted when such people sacrifice a bull it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice when they sacrifice a lamb it is though they sacrificed a dog when they bring an offering of grain they might as well offer blood the blood of a pig when they burn frankincense is it is, is it is as if they blessed an idol it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice now i don't know but if a christian wrote this translation they was on to something we already know the tanakh is with this the tanakh teaches there's no human sacrifice for people. You don't you can't be killed and die for other people to get their sins forgiven. You die for your own sins. Now, people can die because of you. If I'm a drunk driver and I crash into a crowd of people, guess what? People die because of me. I killed them. Was it a sacrifice? No. But they died because of something I did. If I lace everybody's drinks with poison, yep. They died for my sin. But if I go and shoot somebody, they're not going to go and find my son and execute him in place of me. It doesn't work like that. Hosea 13 and 2, God's word translation, they keep on sinning more and more. They make idols from silver for themselves. These idols are skillfully made. All of them are the work of craftsmen. People say this about the Israelites. They offer human sacrifices and kiss calf-shaped idols. They kiss animal-shaped idols. Now, that's interesting because if you have a lamb that represents Jesus or the fish that represents Jesus and you kiss it, you're doing exactly what this is talking about. It says they, they say this about the Israelites. They offer human sacrifices. That's not good. Second Kings 3, 26 through 27. When the king of Moab saw he was losing the battle, he took 700 swordsmen to try to break through to the kingdom, the king of Edom. But when they but they couldn't do it. Then he took his firstborn son who would have succeeded him as king and sacrificed him on the wall as a burnt offering. There was a bitter anger against the Israelites, so they went home to their own country. So we see pagans. We see other people who practice this type of thing. He killed his firstborn son who would have succeeded him as king and sacrificed him on the wall as a burnt offering. And on top of everything, Jesus was not burnt. Sacrifices was supposed to be burnt and they weren't supposed to come back to life. So his sacrifice don't count on so many levels. He wasn't brought to an altar. The priest didn't do it. It's too many problems with it. And he wasn't burnt. And he didn't stay dead. Not much of a sacrifice at all. 
So Christianity is just another sect of Judaism, nothing to be impressed with, according to the educated rabbis. And here's one of them that Paul claims to be a student of. Well, really, I think Luke claims this to about, about Paul. But nevertheless, Acts 5, 34 through 39, when, when I think that in Acts, when it says he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, but Acts 5, 34 through 39, then one of the council stood up a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people. Now, I think the council is the Sanhedrin. So this is not some, you know, rinky dink dude. This is like a big, big timer. And commanded the people to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourself what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thuidus rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who, obeyed, all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. Now, who does that sound like? When Jesus was killed, did the disciples scatter? When they took him to jail that night, everybody dipped on him, right? Peter denied him, right? He was slain, and this guy had 400 people. Jesus only had the 12 plus the other 70 or so that he sent out. That he told nothing would harm them, right? Luke uh, 10, 19, I believe. Nothing will, no harm will come upon you. But then he says in Matthew 24, 9, they're going to kill you for my name's sake, right? So that doesn't work. But anyway, <clears throat> a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee. Yeah. You heard of Jesus of Galilee, but guess what? who was before him? Judas of Galilee. Everybody only talk about Judas Iscariot. Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census. This was when Jesus was a baby during the census, right? So when he was a baby, there was already somebody running around talking about that they were somebody and drew away many people after him. He also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone for if this plan or this work is of man, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it unless you be found to fight against God. So what the Christians do is they're going to ignore everything that Gamaliel said, except for the last verse, right? That if this is from God, you can't overthrow it, right? Lest you be found to fight against God if it's from God. Because it says if, if it's not from God, it'll come to nothing. But well, guess what? That type of Christianity came to nothing. You know why? The Christians today are not the Christians of the time of the New Testament. The first Christians were Torah observant Jews. Read Acts chapter 20. Read Acts chapter 24. Read Acts uh, chapter 2. They were celebrating the holidays. They were still going to the temple. They were still offering sacrifices. They were keeping the holidays. Do Christians today do all that? Messianic Jews, but not all Christians. Messianic Jews are Christians, but the majority of Christians do not keep the holidays. They don't do any of that. So this type of Christianity came to nothing. Guess why? Paul put it into all that Torah observance. He claims the law was cursed and you got a veil over your eyes and you're not under the law. You're under grace and all kind of things. Now, when he got checked by James, he didn't say none of that in Acts chapter 20, 21. So that's another story. We're going to get to that. But. Gamaliel said, leave the Christians alone. He wasn't worried about them. Why? Because he didn't see nothing different. He's seen a guy who came, stirred some people up, and the Romans killed him, just like Thuidus and Judas of Galilee. Not, he wasn't impressed. He was not impressed at all to where he said, leave them alone. They ain't about nothing, man. We've seen this before. And guess what? We got a verse. Daniel eleven fourteen. 14. Now, in those times, many shall arise up against the king of the south, also violent men of whom your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. 
a.k.a. Jesus Barabbas. Read Matthew 27, 16, when it says Jesus Barabbas, Jesus, son of the father, was in jail with Jesus. And guess what for? Because he killed a man for insurrection. He was trying to rebel against the Romans. He was trying to get it popping, just like Judas and just like Thuidus. And they killed him. They failed. So Gamaliel was like, we've seen this before. Leave them dudes alone, man. We got bigger fish to fry. Like the Romans is killing people. These dudes going around preaching about their dead Messiah is not a problem for us. Whatever. Whatever. Let them do that. They're ignorant anyway. They don't even know much. That's why they following this dude. Anyway, they're not a threat. So the rabbis were not impressed. <clears throat> and just because something becomes popular does not mean it's blessed. Baal worship was prevalent through Israel. It was all over Israel. It took over Israel. Worship and idols was all over Israel. That was the popular thing. Was that mean? Does that mean it was the truth? How many prophets of Baal did Elijah have killed? Wasn't it like 450 or something? That's 450 different churches, possibly, if you break them all up and give them all their own churches, right? Doesn't say that. I'm just giving an example of if you took all those people and made them their own separate minister, that's 450 different churches times I don't know how many people could have been in each church throughout Israel. So this was what, what this was popular. Does that mean that the prophets of Baal were right? Because it took off and it gained a, bu a bunch of followers. There's like 500 million Hindus who worship a bunch of gods. That means that they're right. There's like almost probably a billion Muslims. Does that mean they're right? And there's almost like a billion Christians. Does that mean they're right? And there's like 30 million Jews or something like that. Probably not even that many. Numbers do not mean anything. Israel wasn't the biggest nation. Remember that? He started off with 70 going down into Egypt. Wasn't a lot. Wasn't about how many people you got on the team. He told Elijah, I got 7,000 that didn't bend the knee to Baal. 7,000 out of how, who knows how many people. That's not a lot. Quality, man. It's about quality. So 2 Kings 21, 1 through 9. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 50 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. Excuse me. Hephzibah. Hef and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built the high places of which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooded image, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, which the Lord has said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he made his sons pass through the fire, practice soothsaying, use witchcraft, consult the spirits and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to pro provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers, only if they are careful to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they paid no attention, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than all the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So the king, the Messiah of Israel, caused the whole nation to start doing evil and made it popular. Does that mean it was right? His his idol worship and his witchcraft, all that took off and became very popular. Does that mean it was the right thing to do? Because Christianity that we know in the New Testament ended. And Paul's version took off, but really didn't get popping for 300 years until the Romans, the fourth beast, took over and they forced it down everybody's throat. Because if that's 
how are you going to say everybody became Christian? It was by forcing ignorance. People who couldn't read and write and challenge the priest and ask questions and was tortured. Look up the inquisitions. See what the 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 uh, law of discovery did to many people around the world, wherever the church went, they dominated using the New Testament. As a sword, as Jesus claimed, was killing people and forcing them to convert. Is that what you're going to call? What God wanted? Exodus 23 and 2, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You don't follow crowds to do evil. Just because something's popular don't make it right. So just because Christianity took off years later and it was a different version of Christianity. Completely different version. The crowds and the disciples are unlearned, and so is Jesus depending on the gospel. Luke 22, 46 to 47. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So in Luke, it made it sound like Jesus was just a little genius, right? But in John 7, 12 to 19, it says there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? Look at what it means that he does not know letters. Some translation says grammatic, grammaticus or something like that. Like basically he doesn't, he's illiterate. It's, why would they say he never studied if Luke says that he was just astounding the rabbis back then? What happened? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So that right there tell you Jesus ain't God because he's saying what he's saying ain't his, it's God's. So if it was his, he would have says my doctrine is mine. Or ours, <laughs> but he only, he don't say that. If anyone do, wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. Which means he don't have the authority because he ain't God. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Well, we know that that's not true. To say none of you keep the law. Nobody, that's not true, because we know in Luke, uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias kept the law. But if you say, well, he's not talking to them, this is true. But it doesn't say who he's talking to either, does it? See how that works? This crowd does not know the law and is accursed. John 7, 47 through 49. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So the Pharisees like this crowd is ignorant. That's why they don't know nothing. They don't know nothing. So they, they just follow in somebody who's doing miracles. They only follow him around because he's healing people and, you know, doing miracles. But we know from my last chapter or my, my last lecture, miracles don't prove much about who is righteous. Go listen to part one of this lecture. Acts 4.13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Like, oh, these dudes is ignorant and they've been with dude who's ignorant, doing miracles. Because it says... How does this man know letters having never studied? Meaning we ain't seen you in Yeshiva. You, how old? You 30 something? You ain't been in Yeshiva, bro. Unless you was in Yeshiva somewhere else, down in Egypt or somewhere, where you talking about this Lamb of God stuff, which they have a, a God lamb uh, dude, a dude with the head of a lamb. I got a lecture on that too. I think it's called uh, this Isaac foreshadowed Jesus. So 
<laughs> the disciples was ignorant according to the New Testament. And even in the New Testament, some people thought Jesus was ignorant. Well, but the, the, so people said, well, how was he able to argue with the Pharisees? And he said so many things about the law and quoted the law. He probably heard some stuff because he even said, haven't you heard it was said? He's not quoting a lot of verses. And when he does quote some verses, he even messes them up. Saying you can't uh, divorce your wife. And if you marry somebody else, that makes you an adulterer. I never read that, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, he says, if you marry her, unless it's uh, sex for sexual morality, then it makes you an adulterer. But if you marry somebody else, it makes you an adulterer after the facts. So anyway, they're calling him and his disciples ignorant in the New Testament. The disciples had no idea about a dying Messiah. Mark 9, 9 through 10. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept his, this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. Like, what's he talking about? He's supposed to rise from the dead. Well, because they never read that in the Tanakh. Because you're supposed to die for your own sins. So why would he have to die? Matthew 16, 21 through 22, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised from be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. If this was supposed to be what's going to happen to Jesus, why would Peter be against it? Or are you going to say, well, because he says, get behind me, Satan and all this stuff, right? It's because the Tanakh doesn't say that the Messiah is supposed to go and die for the people. Then we get into the argument of the two messiahs, the 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 uh, Messiah Ben Joseph, and the one who dies in the war. That's another topic. But here we see the disciples are not familiar with him supposed to die according to the text. It's not there. Because you notice he never gives a verse. And if you want to quote Hosea chapter, is it six? It says, the Lord will raise us up on the third day. And who's the us? Read the whole chapter and read the previous chapter. And I wonder if it's talking about maybe Ephraim or anybody else. Possibly go read it for yourself. <clears throat> so. Things used to justify Jesus as a Messiah never happened after his encounter with the Pharisees and priests. He will die and come back on the, the clouds has yet to be proven. Matthew 26, 63 through 64. But Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, to you. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Did the priest witness the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven? Yes or no? Because he specifically says, I put you under oath. And then Jesus says, well, I say to you, you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. Didn't happen. So to say, well, all the, the, the rabbis, you know, they rejected him after all this. Well, he was supposed to come back and prove that, but he didn't do it. So they should accept him, even though he didn't do what he said he was going to do. Excuse me. Is that a proof? Because I told you I was going to do something and didn't do it. That proves that I did it. The false fulfillment citation series. So I, I know there's many, many citations in the New Testament, especially in the book of Matthew. But I have videos and books in the description box covering false fulfillment citations. Some prophecies are not exclusive to Jesus, while others have nothing to do with the Messiah. Example, Zechariah 13 is about a false prophet, but Jesus quotes the verse and applies it to himself. Zechariah 13, 7, Arise, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Matthew 26 and 31 quotes this. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. This whole chapter is about a false prophet. So why is Jesus quoting it? If he even, I mean, people are putting words in his mouth, possibly. He probably never said it, but 
Matthew said he said it, right? So does G does Jesus fulfill Zechariah 12 and 10 or is Zechariah 13, 7? I got a lecture on this and I break all this down, but I'm just going to read this real quick to give you context. Zechariah 13, uh, 1 through 7. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the habitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. That right there tell you, you don't need nobody to die for your sin if there's going to be a fountain open in that day. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and shall be no, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. And it shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, you shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. Clearly a false prophet, right? And it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe or coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet. I am a farmer for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer those in which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. So clearly this is chapters about a false prophet, which Jesus applies to himself, which is very weird. Zechariah 13 commentary. <clears throat> Barnes and Note, Barnes notes on the Bible. His father and mother that begat him shall say to him, Thou shall not live. The pr prophet describes a zeal against false prophecy with references to the law against those who seduce to apost apostasy from God. We read this in Deuteronomy 13. The nearest relations were themselves to denounce any who had secretly tried to seduce them and themselves as the accusers to cast the first stone at him. Zechariah 13, 4. Again, it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies they will not wear a robe of course here to deceive. So the whole context is about a false prophet. So it's interesting that Jesus quotes a chapter that's talking about a false prophet and applies it to himself. And you wonder why the rabbis rejected him. The educated Jews rejected him. <clears throat> so here's a summary. Why I left Christianity part two. Summary, why did the Jews reject Jesus? He was not a king and he did not rebuild the temple. Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. He did not put an end to war. Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. He made others sin. Matthew 9, 14 through 15. He and his disciples were ignorant of the Torah according to the New Testament. Luke 7, 14. John 7, 49. Acts 4, 13. He was just another person that made himself important. Acts 5, 34 through 39. He quotes himself to be a false prophet. Matthew 26 and 31. It's no wonder the educated Jews rejected Jesus. It's no wonder. It's not a mystery. If you ask a Christian why the Jews rejected Jesus, they're going to say, oh, they were blind and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. But when you ask a Jew, he's going to tell you everything that I just said, if not more of why they don't rock with the New Testament or their version of the Messiah. So I think next I'm going to deal with why did the Jews reject Paul? Because now we're just talking about G Paul. Paul's a whole nother entity. <clears throat> Paul's really the author of Christianity as you know it today. But the original Christianity were Torah observant Jews who just believed the man was the Messiah. And it's not really clear that they even worshipped him. Some verses say a few people did, but overall, he was not looked at as a Messiah. He was more of a miracle worker that was a preacher, a homeless miracle worker that was a preacher, because it says the Son of Man don't have a place to lay his head. So he was a homeless miracle worker that preached and was executed by the Romans and made a martyr. So with that, um, thanks for listening. We will see you next time, and shalom.